On Tech News Today, Android Wear gets Wi-Fi, Nokia gets back into the smartphone business, and Google almost gets Tesla. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, April 20th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by LittleBits, the easy way to build electronics with modular building blocks. Go to littlebits.com slash TNT. You get $20 off your first kit plus free shipping in the U.S. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is CNET Editor-in-Chief Lindsay Turrentine. How are you doing, Lindsay? I'm doing great. It's a, it's a nice Monday. It was a nice weekend, all rested. It really was. It was a great weekend. Of course, we celebrated here Twit's 10th anniversary. This is a 10th anniversary bundle package of sugar. And so Ooh, I'm going to go into a diabetic coma after the show because I'm going to eat the whole box. And so... Um, <laughs> I may or may not be on the show tomorrow. We'll see how be it Be careful. Goes. Be careful, Mike. Yeah, and, and don't tell my dentist either. Well, um, you know, a funny thing happened uh, today. A, an excerpt was published from Ashley Vance's upcoming book called Elon Musk, colon, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future. This is due out May 19th, but he published an expert, uh, excerpt that had a bombshell in it, which is that a couple of years ago, Tesla almost sold, or Elon Musk almost sold Tesla to Google, came really close. They were on the brink of bankruptcy. They negotiated a deal with Google. Apparently, uh, Sergey Brin or Larry, no, Larry Page is a personal friend of Elon Musk. They started the negotiation. They talked about it, and I think at the end, Google said, nah, I don't think so. But wow, we, you know, could, we could be driving Google, you know, cars at this point. It, it seems like they came to a verbal agreement, and then... Once they actually started to dig into the details, it was exactly the moment when Tesla pulled it together. And yeah. all of a sudden, good numbers started to come in. And, and I think that it was like an, oh, never mind yeah. kind of moment. But I think this is an interesting reminder of how dicey that whole project was. Yeah. Because right now, I mean, at least in the Bay Area, you see, you see Teslas everywhere. It yeah. gives the impression of, of huge success. Kind of crazy to think that there was a moment when Elon Musk was about to essentially give up on it. It really is crazy. And, you know, I remember when that was happening, there were rumors that they were talking. And the assumption was that Google was talking to Tesla about building its self-driving technology into Teslas. And people started talking about self-driving Teslas. And it turns out that's not what they were talking about at all. They were talking about an acquisition. And, of course, it's funny also in the light of the fact that people have been talking for a long time about Apple buying Tesla. Uh, that, that acquisition makes sense in a couple of ways. One is that Steve Jobs says he always wanted an iCar. And number two, Apple is obsessed with acquiring battery technology and Tesla has amazing battery technology. They also have a lot of manufacturing prowess that may or may not be of use to Apple. But uh, anyway, interesting uh, nugget. I can't wait to read the book. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll have Ashley Vance on the next time he publishes an excerpt, assuming that he does publish another one. Well, Lindsay, let's jump right into the news. Google announced today a huge update or the Android Wear platform. Uh, speaking to us about this is Ed Begg, a technology columnist for USA Today. How you doing, Ed? I'm good. How you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Now, the big news here is that Android Wear watches, from now on, won't always need a phone. How does that work? Well, basically, uh, with the update, the software update that's coming to these watches, uh, Wi-Fi support has been added. So... You know, the classic example, you know, you're you're at the gym, you want to leave the phone in the locker. Uh, well, when you're out and about sweating, presumably, uh, you can get your notifications, you can do some app work, you can basically do a lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, previously required having the phone nearby. And again, it's working through Wi-Fi. And the beauty here is that the phone will need to be, excuse me, yes, the phone will need to be connected somewhere to Wi-Fi. And so will the watch, but they don't have to be on the same network. And for that matter, the phone could also be connected via cellular and could be miles and miles away. If you accidentally left at home, 
you can still uh, do a lot of the functions on the watch. And that's different from the Apple Watch, right? The Apple Watch can function on the same well, Wi-Fi yeah. network when separated, but not on separate networks. So that's, that's, that's a pretty right. big deal. Do most watches already have the Wi-Fi hardware that they need to support this? Or are most consumers going to have to wait for, for new watches? I suspect most consumers will have to wait, wait for the new watches, although we don't know that for sure. Of course, Apple obviously just launching the, the, uh, the watch. So I don't think they're going to do anything in the short term to, to deal with this. And let's be, let's, be, let's be real here. You know, Apple is still getting all the attention. Even if Google passes them with some of the features that this new update brings, you know, at least for this week, it's still all about the Apple Watch. And there were some other updates as well in this, uh, in this new uh, rollout. Uh, tell us about this uh, new gesture uh, for moving to the next card on Android Wear. Yeah, basically it's a flick out and a flick in gesture, which either advances to the next card or, you know, retreats to the one before it. I haven't actually been able to try this yet. So I wonder, you know, my question was, you know, how easy is it going to be? Is it going to be awkward? Might you accidentally enable it? Uh, if you do find you accidentally enable it, you can certainly disable that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a nice, in theory anyway, it's a nice, nice little thing that, you know, just that flick, flick of the wrist will let you move forward or back. So there's also a new always on feature, and this lets you look at the, look at the watch and keep the display on all the time for certain applications. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and whether yeah, or not you think it's going to destroy battery life? Well, uh, Google says it won't destroy battery life because it's it's working in sort of this low power mode. In fact, the, the, the watch display in most cases will go black and white. So it's not, in theory, going to drain, drain much power there. And the idea, of course, is, you know, we don't have to tap the watch. You don't have to shake it in any weird way, do any weird gesturing. The idea is you glance at your watch. I mean, we glance at watches, old-fashioned watches, to tell the time. Well, now you could glance at it to see whatever is on the screen that you want on the screen. So again, if you're out at the grocery store, you could theoretically keep the grocery list there as long as you needed to peek at it as you're going, you know, patrolling the aisles in your local supermarket. For example, on Google Keep, which uh, which is a great, uh, right. I think it's a great feature because, you know, the, the truth is that Android Wear watches are kind of, you know, sometimes you have to make an exaggerated gesture to get it to light up. That's right. And, you know, you have to do this big thing, you know, it's okay. And it'd be nice to just be able to look at it and see what's going on. But what do you care, Ed? You're wearing an Apple Watch already, so <laughs> you don't... <laughs> I am wearing an Apple Watch right now. But you know what? I play in all camps. My job as such, you know, I'm Switzerland. So, um, so I have used Android watches. I like the Moto 360. And I should point out that this new update is coming first to the, uh, to the new LG uh, watch. Uh, and I'm actually, that looks like a very nice watch. So I yeah. am going to try it for sure. It's that's the LG watch Urbane. Yeah. And that's a high end, beautiful looking, uh, looks like a real right. watch and everything. Uh, well, Ed, it's a, it's a thankless task to have to play with all these gadgets early, but somebody's got to do it. And uh, we all thank you for doing it. Absolutely. All right. You can find Ed Begg at usatoday.com and also on Twitter at Ed Begg. That's E-D-B-A-I-G. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ed. A absolutely. Good to be with you. Let us know what your feelings are these days about the Android Wear platform in the wake of all we've learned about the Apple Watch. Send email to TNT at twit.tv. Let us know what's on your mind and on your wrist and what's going to be on your wrist. Well, in just a sec, we got some uh, more news coming up. But first, I want to tell you about Little Bits. Little Bits is a really, really cool thing. The trouble with technology nowadays is that everything is made as an appliance. Everything's made as a consumer device. And so lots of people are using computers and technology, and they have no idea how it works, how to build it, what's going on. They just get this black box and they poke at it and they're really not you know people think they're into technology but in fact they're not really interacting with the technology part of it at all well little bits are modular building blocks they snap together with magnets and you can create circuits in seconds and it's great for kids but it's also great for parents and coders people who want to mess around play around anybody with curiosity uh engineering students whoever is interested in really learning more about electronics and having fun doing it Little Bits is the way to go. And, you know, you have module, modules ranging from the very simple to the very complex. For example, for kids, they have a base and deluxe kids, which are 
uh, kits, which are really great for children and, and for beginners. They have a space kit that was developed in partnership with NASA. No, you can't build rockets with it, but you can do all kinds of really cool space-oriented projects. And the Arduino coding kit introduces kids to programming. Such a fantastic thing. There's a synth kit for musicians, for programming, of course, is the Arduino coding kit. It's not just for kids, it's for adults as well. Check out a little bit. I want you to go to the site and check them out. They're offering new customers $20 off their first kit, plus free shipping in the U.S. Just go to littlebits.com slash TNT. That's littlebits.com slash TNT. And if you make something really cool, post it on Instagram, and we'd love to see it. Let me know. Send email to TNT at twit.tv with a link to your Instagram post or wherever you post. You can post it anywhere. Uh, but let us know. We'd like to showcase it on this show. Well, Recode is reporting in an exclusive that Nokia intends to get back into the smartphone handset business as soon as next year. Unlike before, when Nokia headed up the manufacturing of its own phones, the future plans center around Nokia licensing its designs to other companies that will handle not only manufacturing, but also sales and distribution. Nokia also plans to get into other areas, including virtual reality. Nokia sold its mobile unit to Microsoft a year ago, and under the terms of that deal, Nokia is prohibited from selling Nokia-branded phones. But... That contract runs out at the end of the year. So it looks like we're going to see Nokia brand phones here at some point. Lindsay Turntine, any thoughts on this? Is this worth doing to do the sort of licensing of their designs and their technology? I think it probably is. I think it's kind of clever, actually. I mean, the brand still has a lot of name recognition around the world. Nokia, uh, according to the piece, Ina reports that, Ina Fried reports that the uh, the Nokia N1, an Android tablet that followed this model, has been released in China. Um, this is a, probably a great model for some of these emerging markets, and it's kind of a clever way to keep some to keep all that value that comes with the brand, not just throw it away. Wow, my lights went out. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was you and not me. I thought it was like, you know, <laughs> my brain was flickering there for a second. Well, you know, it's it's a great uh, thing that they're getting back into what sounds like they're getting back into the consumer marketplace, probably also the business marketplace. They have a lot of technology and a lot of patents and a lot of brilliant engineers. So I'm really excited to see, you know, if you look at what they, you know, people think, ah, Nokia, you know, you think of those old phones we used to have in the, you know, early 2000s. But really, think about uh, think about their their camera phones, best ever made. The best cameras in any smartphones were came from Nokia. If you think about the uh, Nokia um, uh, here mapping application, really great stuff. They they have a history of building really great technology. They just happen to get their uh, get taken to the cleaners by Apple and Google, who uh, who sort of outmaneuver them in the smartphone handset and and mobile platform business. Um, but uh, but I can't wait to see them get back into into the business and uh, you know it, it's kind of ironic but they'll be competing with Microsoft again so it's kind of funny and it's it is nice to see them in the business of design really what they're doing is building some business around the most fun part of the process yeah absolutely sounds kind of cool yeah sort of like Apple does design in California. Or Finland, yeah. in this case. <laughs> uh, well, it looks like Windows 10 may ship in late July. We learned this when AMD CEO Lisa Su said during Friday's earnings call that AMD is factoring in, quote, the Windows 10 launch at the end of July, unquote. The apparent slip came in an, an answer to an analyst question, and that's why I think this is pretty legit. It wasn't part of her prepared statements. It just came, came out when she was trying to answer a question. And so that sounds... Um, Reasonable, especially in light, Lindsay Turntine, of the fact that Microsoft uh, said that it would come in the summer at some point. Yeah, I mean, this makes a lot of sense. It's surprising that she made the mistake, but not the, the, the fact itself is not really very surprising at all. Uh, except maybe that, you know, the end of July is the doldrums for tech news generally. And most people tend to be kind of on vacation, not really paying a lot of attention. Sort of wonder if this is uh, Microsoft's way of trying to get people when they have a little bit more time to think about it and then sort of slowly ramp up to having to deal with a bunch of new customers. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it is, you know, it's a mixed bag. If you go for the hot season, you also can get buried. Although I doubt that the launch of Windows 10 would get buried under any circumstances. Um, you know, Apple would have to, to, to come out with a, you know, a robot or something like that for that <laughs> to be buried. So it's always big news when a new version of Windows comes out. Well, uh, if you have any um, thoughts on this uh, story, um, send email to TN tw TNT at twit.tv. We'd love to hear what you think uh, about all this and about Windows 10, whether you're planning to upgrade to it. 
and um, just how you're thinking about the world of operating systems on the desktop and on tablets. Well, Google is changing its search algorithm tomorrow to favor mobile-friendly sites. The change is being called Mobilegeddon because sites uh, that are not sufficiently optimized for viewing on a smartphone will be knocked down the rankings in Google search results. How bad is this? Well, the research firm Portent said that, uh, or Portent, <laughs> said that 10,000 websites out of the top 25,000 sites failed Google's mobile-ready test. And this includes the Department of Homeland Security. This is an astonishingly high number, Lindsay Turn Time, because, you know, these are the top sites, right? These are sites that are likely to rank on the first page, and they're going to lose their spot on the first page because they're not, according to Google, mobile-ready. Well, what's surprising about it to me is that you know, Google has a tool for webmasters that's very easy to use. You just type in your URL and it tells you whether or not it's mobile friendly. It's super simple. And this is not a surprise. It is not a surprise that Google has been working on this particular algorithm shift. So I kind of think if you are a top ranking site and you have not fixed this problem, you're not paying attention. That's that's exactly right. And, you know, it's really a bad idea anyway, regardless of the search engine rankings, because more than half of, you know, traffic to websites these days comes from a mobile device. So you just, you, you know, you'd have to just not care or something. I mean, it's just a, it's a dereliction of duty if, you, if you're not mobile ready these days. Sure. And it's very frustrating for users. I mean, they, the reason Google is doing this is because they want everyone to have a good experience with their search results, um, presumably. And it, they just don't want people to be frustrated when they click through from a link. Right. And, and, and it also, you know, there's, there's some chatter in the chat room that's uh, an instant uh, argument going on in there. But, uh, you know, one of the arguments is who, is who does Google think they are to, to make this decision? But I think the same could be said for the other direction. Who do, why, you know, what, what responsibility does Google have to, to link to, you know, or favor sites that are going to give people a bad experience? They try to have search results that are going to result in the best end user experience. And so if people are going to their site and it's a, a lousy mobile experience or regardless, then, you know, I think it's their responsibility to knock them down a few pegs. That's not the best link. You know? Yeah. Although it could be, I mean, it, it's sort of, this is maybe a little bit of a stretch, but you could sort of say that Google's forcing this hand now because it may ultimately want the web to be more readable for Android Wear, which is a couple steps down the road, but they really are going to need the web to get cleaner yeah. in order for those products to work. So yeah. there may be some ulterior motives here. There could be. Well, in product update news, Twitter announced today that you can now send private messages to people even if they don't follow you. The old policy, which restricted private messages to people who followed each other, forced users to send publicly what should have been private, which led to troll attacks and other problems. Uh, Lindsay, bit by bit, they're, they're sort of fixing their troll and harassment issue, and I think this is an important one. Yeah, this is. it's interesting to see the different ways in which people react to this news. Uh, journalists kind of across the board are going, yay, this is great. Uh, or some of them are, this is great. People can get in touch with me more easily. And then a lot of uh, female journalists are saying, no, this is not great. This just means that people can send me obscene things more easily. Um, and, and then most end users are probably just kind of going, huh? Well, well, okay. I, I think that the people who say that this is a bad thing because people can now send you harassment messages, uh, I think, Private harassment messages are better than public ones, personally. And, you, can, you, you know, just as, as before, you can block them. But uh, in the past, the problem with trolling is that those harassment messages that are public are beyond anything that, that the person could control. Whereas if somebody's sending you private messages, blocking them ends the harassment. Like, if they're only post sending them directly and privately, and you block that person, no one will ever see the harassment. You know, there's no avenue. Right. So I, I think it's I think it's great. And, you know, I think the other the other problem is that, you know, there there are a lot of people who are in the public eye who want to communicate with someone via Twitter. And when they send a, a public message because they had been forced in the past to do so, then the trolls who follow them can now put that person they were trying to contact into their crosshairs. And so that it was a big problem. And I think I, I personally think this is a great change. All right. Well, in product obituary news, Norway plans to become the first nation in the world to kill FM radio. FM radio will be phased out one region at a time starting in January 2017 and concluding in December of that year. The nation has 5 million people. That's its population and five FM stations. 
radio content will be moved to the Digital Audio Broadcasting Network, which is really popular in Norway right now. They have far more stations than the five that are on FM. And about half of audio listeners are already on the digital network. So that's a really, really cool move. I just think radio is completely obsolete, though. Uh, uh, podcasting uh, should just completely replace it, in my opinion. There's just absolutely no benefit to radio over uh, podcasting, as far as I can tell. Yeah, that's your completely unbiased opinion. Yes, it is. Well, <laughs> and, 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 and in fact, I'm on record as having done that before I was anywhere near uh, doing any sort of podcasting. So I've always been a huge, huge fan of podcasting. I think it's the greatest, greatest medium in the history of mankind. And it's just what advantage is there to radio? I just don't see the advantage. It's just, there's zero advantage. You, the ideal thing is you subscribe to all the specific content you want and it just queues up and you listen one thing after another. It's just perfect. It's great. I do. I, you know, I actually, I am an FM radio listener, mostly because I listen to a lot of public radio and I do enjoy the serendipity of that. Uh, I do think that there's, there's something to just turning on a station and letting the information come to you and maybe not, Maybe being a little surprised by what you hear, which you can be with podcasts. But I think there's a role for both, honestly. Yeah, I listen to I listen to public radio too in my podcasting app. <laughs> Every single public radio show there is is also a podcast. Uh, so anyway, that's just my opinion. Uh, I, I personally believe that if if listening to podcasts was as easy, you, you probably listen a lot in your car or whatever, as listening to public radio, you might do that as well. I mean, you you can tune to you know, all things considered, uh, on a podcast, you should be able to t tune to it just as easily as you just t turn on um, public radio. But I see what you're saying. I mean, there's, it's like the old newspaper argument. Uh, if you can customize exactly what you want to hear, then you're missing out on the stuff that, you know, and, and that's why, one of the reasons why I listen to, uh, why I read the New York times, because it exposes me to all these stories that I wouldn't think of as listening, uh, in terms of my list of interests. And it exposes me to stories and information that uh, I wasn't looking for, you know. So I guess uh, we have the same argument for different media. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Hack Attack News, Russian hackers have exploited flaws in Adobe Flash and Microsoft Windows to hack governments around the world, according to a new report from FireEye. The hackers are members of a well-known group called APT28, which targets information that would, quote, likely benefit the Russian government, unquote. In other words, this is a Russian government. <laughs> and uh, that would be my guess anyway. Adobe has already issued a patch and Microsoft is working on one. And will the hacking never cease? Yeah, this is like Groundhog Day. Every Monday we have this story and it's either China or Russia or maybe some other. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's it's amazing the the rapidity with which these developments keep coming out. And I think uh, everybody should be paying attention to them, even if it seems repetitive. And it has to be said that China was in the lead on a lot of this stuff. Uh, but Russia is, is really coming on strong these days. They seem to be investing a lot in their in their hacking and, and espionage. And uh, so, yeah, here it comes. Uh, better uh, better do something about it. If you have a, a government website, uh, maybe the, they'll, they'll get around to doing that in 10 or 20 years. Well, in uh, government crackdowns, Germany has developed new rules for crowd investing, according to the Wall Street Journal. The companies will be required to detailed information about their businesses and investors will be required to disclose their wealth in some cases. The stated goal is to protect investors from fraud. Also, private investors will be banned from spending more than 10,000 euros on any single project. And people wanting to invest more than 1,000 euros will have to prove they have 100,000 euros in liquid funds or a monthly income that's more than twice the amount invested. Uh, you know, it's uh, there it is, Lindsay. The, uh, Europe just never saw anything they didn't want to regulate to death. I, I, you know, that's just my quasi-libertarian American attitude talking. But uh, it seems to me that, uh, you know, people should be free, free to waste their money and take risks with their own money. But that's just me. Well, you know, this is interesting. This is actually not that different from some of the regulations that the United States has for investing in. Like if you'd say you want to invest in, in a, a building project, you do, if you want to spend more than a certain amount of money, have to prove that you're, you have liquidity in order to make that investment. So it's, it's not terribly different from some of what you already see happening here in the States. Um, I do think that it's an interesting move that we haven't seen for crowdfunding in the U S and I, I, one would like to see just a tiny bit of a tiny bit more consumer protection for crowdfunding because I've seen so many people get built. Uh, right. Um, they do get built, but again, you know, if you go to Vegas and, and, uh, get uh, drunk and spend all your money, that's, that's legal and it should be legal. Uh, it's not the government's money. It's your money and you should be able to waste it.
Anyway, sure. Just sure. my thought, uh, or risk it at least. Um, and of course, it is always a risk to uh, to invest in something like a Kickstarter project. Well, we got more news coming up in just a sec. But first, let's talk about Gazelle. You know, an interesting report came out today. Uh, a depressing <laughs> and tragic uh, report came out that points out that the world threw out 92 billion pounds of electronics last year. A huge amount of electronic waste. Uh, this came from the United Nations University. I didn't know the United Nations had a university, but anyway, they do. And in the U.S. alone, uh, Americans tossed out 7.1 million metric tons of e-waste, which is nearly 16 billion pounds. That's basically how much the Great Pyramid of Giza wastes, and we did that in one year. So that's a lot of waste. We shouldn't be wasting uh, uh, electronics uh, unnecessarily because many of those products that have gone in wherever they go uh, could have been uh, put back into use. And one way to do that is Gazelle. In fact, the easiest way to do that is Gazelle. I've been using Gazelle for a long time, and it is super, super easy. You just... Go to the site, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. You just click uh, on the easy use site to, to indicate what sort of phone. Is it an iPhone? Is it an Android phone? You indicate its condition, and then they send you a box. You put it in the box, and off it goes, and you get paid. Super, super easy. And, you know, the problem is if you wait, if you wait a couple of years for a device and then want to sell it, okay, the battery is going to be problematic. The value is going to be very low. At some point, it's just not going to be worth selling. So you want to jump on that right away. The sooner you sell it to Gazelle, the better that phone will be for the person who buys it. The more money you are going to get for it, the better it is for everybody. And best of all, this is a person who's going to be buying a pre-owned device instead of a new one. That means that new device they would have bought will not be manufactured and the device that you are selling back to Gazelle will not be thrown into this massive trash heap of uh, e-waste. And so it's just good for everyone uh, involved and everyone in the world. The, if, the more we can put things back into use, the better it is for the environment. And of course, if you want to buy a device from Gazelle, you can buy them in either certified like new conditions or certified good. Certified like new is just like a brand new phone. And uh, all devices have been put through a rigorous 30-point inspection. And certified pre-owned phones are backed by a 30-day risk-free return policy. So you absolutely risk nothing. So find out what your iPhone's worth and help the environment. Take a minute, go to gazelle.com and find out. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. We got a big number for you today, 800 million. Yeah, that, if, you, if you haven't uh, already guessed, that is a Facebook big number. That's how many monthly active users WhatsApp claims to have. WhatsApp, of course, was bought by Facebook last year for $22 billion dollars. Facebook also has 1.4 billion monthly users on, for Facebook itself, and its Messenger app has about 600 million. You know, I'd love to know the total. There's, of course, lots of over, overlap there, especially overlap between Facebook and Messenger. But I would love to know the total number of living souls that are active users of either Facebook or WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. It's got to be a gigantic number. I don't think, uh, Lindsay Turntine, any company in the world has as many users as Facebook. No, it's pretty astounding. And um, I, I was just thinking, this is like 160 times the size of Norway. Yeah. <laughs> we were yeah. just talking about the population of Norway. Yeah. This is a huge, I mean, Facebook touches everyone in, almost in some way. And there are a lot of people who hate it, but there is no denying that, that Facebook's impact has remained extremely strong. Yeah. It's an alternative internet, and uh, whether you love or hate the internet, uh, if you want to interact with human beings, you have to use the internet. And likewise on Facebook, if you want to social network with people, with all the people you know, there's only one place where all the people you know are, or almost all the people you know, and that's Facebook, or you know, in this case, WhatsApp or whatever. They have the big, big numbers, and they have what I call the monopoly on everybody. And they got it early, and they'll <laughs> never get rid of it because once you have everybody, you know, it's like I can't stand Facebook. I hate Facebook, but I use it all the time because that's where everybody is. So, yep, you use it to get in touch, like it or not. Yep. Well, in news, you can lose the next Star Wars flick called The Force Awakens features a cool new robot called the BB-8 droid, which everybody really likes because it's a working robot instead of CGI or Hollywood puppetry. Now, a guy named Christian Paulson liked it so much he built his own, but a very small one. He uh, used as his foundation a remote control ball called Sphero and attached the head using magnets. Note that Sphero actually helped Disney create the BB-8. And if you're looking at the video version, uh, there it is rolling around. There's a little tiny BB-8 
How cool is that? Uh, I just, uh, I really like this robot. It's really uh, innovative. It's adorable. Cool. It's yeah. adorable and it's really smart marketing from Sphero. <laughs> Really smart marketing, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just a, a great thing. And you know, the 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 people who are in charge of these franchises that have really devoted fans, like the Star Wars uh, franchise, you know, they really have to be smart about thrilling those fans. And something like this robot, actually building a robot that they can trot, trot out in public, like they did at last week's uh, press conference is the kind of thing that really, really thrills fans because we like the real thing instead of just CGI. And I think the last the last Star Wars uh, movies were a little CGI heavy. It's great to see that they're getting some uh, real stuff back. Well, we got some feedback from a TNT fan named Nick Gassman who said the following. I'm an avid fan of the podcast and generally listen in bed in the UK as it comes out in the evening here. I felt I had to comment. Wait a minute. It's only like seven o'clock at night. Well, anyway, uh, I, I felt I had to comment on the last uh, on the item last week on the European action against Google shopping. The journalist you interviewed, he's speaking about Amira Fradi, said a number of times that since Google, it was Google's search engine, they could, in his opinion, show what they wanted in the results. This strikes me as an uninformed and unhelpful opinion. When anyone starts a company, there are immediate laws they have to conform to. It's not a matter of personal opinion, as stated by the interviewed journalist, whether you believe that Google should or should not be able to display results in a certain way. Additionally, it seems to me that the actions by the French Senate are unrelated to the proceedings of the European Commission, although they seem to get mixed up in the interview. The French do have their own way of looking at the world that doesn't necessarily represent the broader view, European view. That is true, and it certainly doesn't represent the broader global view, which is exactly why the French should not be trying to censor Google globally. Uh, but anyway, just to, to be fair to Amira Fradi, his, Amira Fradi, his point was that uh, Google's opinion about what's relevant is the product. That's what you're getting from Google when you go to Google search. Uh, and so that was an interesting point, I thought, a controversial one. I'm not sure that uh, that our co-anchor on that day, uh, Christina Warren, agreed with him on that. Uh, but uh, and, and I'm sort of on the fence about it. I mean, it's an interesting point to say that this is what Google is. This is what the Google product is. It's their opinion about what's relevant. What do you think, uh, Lindsay Turrentine? Oh, gosh. I don't know <laughs> if I want to wade into this at right. the moment. <laughs> well, it's, it's optional. I, you know, I, do, I, think, I think that everybody is entitled to their opinion about whether or not it's Google's right to do whatever they want. I, I do, however, think that when any product becomes the de facto way that people research the world, get information about their life and about the way the world works. There is an obligation to do that in a fair way. Now, the nuances of how we sort out what's fair and what isn't are, is, you know, the devil's in the details. Yeah. And the problem I have, and, and, and the thing that I always go back to is that there's no such thing as opinion-free or value-free or judgment-free search results. They, there's just no possible way to do that in a way that isn't what you might call biased. And so whose bias should it have? The European regulators bias? Should it have everybody's, I mean, how do you, you know, what, what, what I think Google tries to do is they, they seem to try to enhance the user experience. They have personalization, so they add the user's bias. Uh, and then they also may or may not uh, be biased in favor of their own products. I would be surprised if they weren't biased in, in favor of their own products. And the way they've explained it is oftentimes in trying to uh, improve the user experience, especially for these highly formatted searches around which this case is uh, revolves, the Google Shopping uh, thing, they say that a lot of the competitors just have lousy data, the way it's formatted, all that kind of stuff, which doesn't result in a good experience. And so they knock them down a few notches. Uh, I think that... Yeah, I think that all of these biases, um, even within Google, Google, Google makes the, the the straight up regular search results such a black box. Nobody from outside Google really understands exactly why Google makes the decisions that it does. And Google does not share its opinions um, publicly about about those search results. And the interesting thing is that I, I get the impression from some folks that I've talked to that even within Google, other teams don't have a lot of access to that, to the to the team that really works on those algorithms. Um, so I think that they are trying to be as fair as they can. Now, yeah. whether or not they succeed is another issue. Yep, absolutely true. And it's, you know, uh, two other weird uh, uh, elements to this. One is that uh, the French uh, uh, Senate uh, 
voted in the a new rule that would force Google to hand over its algorithms or open it alg its algorithms somehow to demonstrate what's actually going on. And also they're dictating search results saying that at least three competitors have to appear in, on the first page of any search around products and that one of those competitors has to be a French company. And so um, this to me is, uh, you know, the second one I can see Google agreeing to. The first one I think they would leave France before they did that. They're not yeah, gonna, that's absurd. They're not going to open up their their algorithm. That would just be uh, insane. And I would support them leaving France before they did that. That's just, that's a, a crazy requirement. A, absolutely crazy. Uh, but again, just my opinion. So we have another uh, email from a TNT fan named Alan Irwin. This is uh, speaking of Star Wars. Uh, Alan writes, I listen to TNT every day. So imagine my surprise when you mentioned that you saw Star Wars when it first came out at the Arlington Theater in Santa Barbara. I was there as well. I was 21 years old and taking a woman to the show for our first date. Thanks for reminding me about all that. To add even more to the story, I'm attending the Star Wars celebration in Anaheim and was listening to today's TNT while standing in line at one of the fantastic food trucks outside the convention center. Folks in line wondered why I exclaimed out loud when you mentioned the Arlington. It was wonderful. Thank you for the amazing show. Uh, what a small world. I, we went to the same movie in 1970 what, or 80 or what, whenever that came out, uh, Star Wars. Uh, absolutely incredible. That's really cool. And a testament to that movie that you both remember it. Yeah. Well, I'd never seen a line like that uh, for anything ever. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> shocking to see a line like that. And we're pretty far back in the line. We got pretty good seats because the Arlington Theater is massive. It's like a massive movie palace. And uh, yeah, that was quite an experience. I remember it vividly. Well, our TNT fan of the day, sit down for this one, folks. This is just mind-blowing. Our TNT fan of the day is Barry Campbell of Houston, Texas, who's currently living in Seoul, Korea. Barry posted this video on Twitter, and it shows him watching TNT last week in a North Korean bowling alley. It's probably the only bowling alley <laughs> in North Korea, but there that was you and me uh, last uh, Monday, Lindsay Turrentine, and then here he is at the USS Pueblo. Now, USS Pueblo is a U.S. spy ship that was captured by North Korea in 1968. That's a Pyongyang uh, skyline back there. And you can see that pointy building, which is, the you know, empty. It's like a hollow shell. They did it for show uh, and said that, you know, to build this big hotel, which, you know, they, that doesn't actually function. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm not certain, but I think that's the first, um, how do you watch TNT video or picture from inside a North Korean bowling alley. That's amazing. And last Monday is the, is the Monday when I think I said, okay, we're kicking off a, a, an arms race here. Exactly. And we took, and, and <laughs> great job, Barry, because you really took that assignment seriously. <laughs> and this is awesome. Yep. Absolutely. Arms race with North, oh, with North Korea. What else is new? <laughs> It's not with North Korea. He's not with North Korea. Anyway, how do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. Lindsay Turrentine, what's going on with you these days? we got a busy week. Lots of news today. We're um, cranking through it. Got a couple big special series coming up uh, for CNET News in, in the next couple of weeks, so keep your eye on the site. All right, find Lindsay at L Turrentine on Twitter. Lindsay, thank you so much for calling from today. We'll see you next time. See you next week. All right. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on your phone's podcast app. And if you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you can do it. Post a link to TNT on the social media site of your choice. A good link would be twit.tv slash TNT. And then tag three friends along with your recommendation to subscribe. Let's get a lot more subscribers. Let's grow a lot faster. Share the joy. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or on the app or browser plugin of your choice. Follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV, and you can follow me on Twitter at Mike Elgin. Don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. This show was produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. See you tomorrow.